Hi everyone, it's day four of the lockdown of COVID-19. I'm uh, making good use of it, it's a beautiful day, spirits are high, blue sky, sunshine. For a while you would think there was nothing going on, it's so beautiful. So I made the most of it, I have an 8 inch Schmidt Casagrain set up here in the backyard. Uh, ignore the noise in the background, somebody's working in the garden. My mum's out working here in the garden, Rossi's cooking, we've got a, making a barbecue later on, so we're keeping our spirits high. In the meantime I'm observing the crescent moon in broad daylight to the east of the sun. The sun is actually very high now this time of year but to the east of the sun I'd say about 20-25 degrees to the east you can see the slender crescent, waxing crescent moon now visible against a blue sky. Uh, it's the early afternoon here so it's the first time I've observed the moon through a telescope at day late in a long time so I'm at of the 26 millimeter standard super colossal eyepiece in here combined with a focal reducer which I use for deep sky observing for the wide angle and I've just tracked it down here now and you can certainly see the structure in the limb and some of the craters along the eastern side I would say tonight after sunset it'll look nice in the twilight high up uh, probably with the zodiacal light and Venus it's interesting to keep an eye out on the day there's Rhea coming on the day's head over Rhea <laughs> Hey Jim, come on, come on. Here's Rhea, by the way. <laughs> Rhea has to be part of everything, don't you? Hello. You look here observing. Rhea's observing through the telescope. She doesn't clue what's going on, but she's that used to my telescope. She thinks nothing of it. She's probably the only or dog in the area that's familiar with telescopes and drones. Like normal life in our area. Alright, put it back out here. So anyway, the plan is this evening that these blue skies Stay clear, I'll have a barbecue, I'll the telescope out, I'll observe uh, planet Venus and the crescent moon and later if it stays clear and I, and I, if I can get away with it, the light pollution, I'll try Comet Atlas. Uh, but you know something, what I might do is I'll actually try to track down planet Venus in broad daylight. I've done this before many years ago, it's quite a cool feeling to be able to do so. Uh, you can actually see it with a naked eye in broad daylight. When it's a good elongation from the sun, which it is at the minute, it's just a matter of knowing where to look and let your eyes train your eyes to focus on infinity. So I'm going to try to do that now. Um, use uh, the crescent moon as a reference. We actually have buzzards overhead at the moment. Three beautiful buzzards ready in the thermals high up. The blue sky, they're really cool. I can hear them calling. That's a nice, that's a nice sign. This is my mum, Carmel. Uh, we're gonna have a barbecue today, aren't we? Yes, we are. It's and, gonna be good fun. And we're observing through the telescope. We're gonna look at the crescent moon, as I mentioned earlier, maybe Venus later on. Um, mum has been with me for years out some of our astronomy adventures, haven't you? Oh, yes, very much. <laughs> and storm chasing. Yes. And drone flying. Mum and Rhea, her dog, takes a big part in it. Um, but yeah, we're passing the time with this whole thing, Mum, aren't we? Yes, we definitely are. It's great, great to see this out and about. Great weather. Mm -hmm. So we're making the most of this situation. We're having barbecue, we're enjoying the sunshine, making the most of the blue skies, yeah. and keeping optimistic and seeing how we get on. This is day four of the lockdown. <laughs> uh, yeah. So we'll see how we get on. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Okay, I thought I'd give you a quick update while I'm here on Comet 2019Y4 Atlas. The comet is approximately magnitude 7.7 .7 to 7.9. Uh, it's quite a large object with the comet diameter estimates ranging from 10 arc minutes up to 12, 13, 14 arc minutes by some observers. So the comet, uh, it, the comet needs lar um, small apertures to get a proper magnitude estimate. By that I mean if you use a large telescope, say this 8 inch telescope, the magnitude estimate you get with this would be fainter than an app, the magnitude estimate from a pair of binoculars. 80 millimeter binoculars or 10 by 50 millimeter binoculars would be the, the correct tool for the job for making an accurate magnitude estimate of this comet. And the reason is the comet has an extended coma of large diameter, so you need uh, a smaller, uh, smaller aperture instrument with a wider field of view to, to uh, make a proper comparison. So it's called aperture effect, and large instruments are not the correct tools for those kind of comets so worth keeping in mind if you're really into your magnitude estimates 
But at the minute, the comet is bright. It's shown up a very pronounced signage in green in the comb or in CCD images, and it's starting to pick up speed. There's still an Ursa Major between it, Ursa Major and Camelel Opartalis, and is very well placed in the circumpolar skies, very high up. Um, there's definitely a lot of excitement with it. Patience, you should be able to find it with good or dark, dark adaption, but uh, it does seem to be brightening quite well. The rate of brightening has actually slowed down somewhat, which is not entirely unexpected for a comet, because it goes through a transition period uh, from gaseous state to maybe a dusty state, or depends on what you the volatiles are working on the nucleus and the size of the nucleus and how active it is and how many uh, jets or regions are active as a ro the nucleus rotates. So, but. Uh, and by April we're expecting this hopefully to be a prominent object in binoculars at least and uh, by that stage the comet will begin lower in the northwestern sky and by the time we get into uh, early to late early to mid May the comet should be at its best for us before it gets too close to the sun and at the minute the predictions are still very highly scattered on what the potential is for maximum magnitude at perihelion. Perihelion, for those who don't know, is um, when they're, the comet is as closest point to the sun. And that's when a comet tends to be at its brightest. Predictions range from about the worst case scenario of magnitude plus two to uh, zero magnitude minus one and some rare cases but credible sources are still saying magnitude minus four which is about the same as Venus and on a good clear blue sky day like guess with good transparency you can actually see Venus in a telescope in the middle of the day beside the sun if you know where to look and you're doing it safely and you can even see it with the naked eye if the conditions are good so if the comet uh, does become around magnitude minus four and that's a big if it will be possible for some people to observe the comet in broad daylight but it, it, that's getting ahead of ourselves. Really what we're focusing on is the pre-perihelion show. What's it going to look like when it gets into the northwest sky from uh, the mid-northern latitudes? Um, I've, got a, I've got a large bee buzzing around me here. Good to see, actually. Uh, so we're hoping, anyway, that we might, at the best case scenario, we may get an object around first magnitude. That's about the magnitude of uh, Deneb, or thereabouts, in the in the constellation of Cygnus as one, which is quite bright. The comet will be low in the northwest, moving down past Uriga, Capella, and into Perseus region. And by the way, Perseus is a famous constellation for great comets. For some reason, it seems to attract bright comets such as Hale Bop and Hayakataki in 1986. So the comet will be low in the northwest. It'll be the time of year when the twilight glow is quite pronounced for us before just before uh, noctilucent cloud season. It may even be possible to see rare early season NLCs around that time too. So imagine getting a relatively bright comet and an early NLC display at the same time. It's certainly possible. And even more so, if that were the case, the comet would be probably in the vicinity of NLCs or even embedded within. But it's a bit of a long shot because usually we get our best displays in late May, early June, but we'll see. But I'm hoping the comet will be naked eye at that time and perhaps with a pronounced gas tail pointing straight up from the horizon. Can't comment on dust tails at the minute because it hasn't produced a large amount of dust. We don't really know what's going on at this stage, but it's still a fair bit out from the sun, so one and a half or two astronomical units. So it's a fair bit to go yet before it gets closer to the sun. And when it does so, it'll be getting strongly baked by very strong solar radiation. Uh, the comet's going to be inside the orbit of Mercury. That's extremely hot. There's a possibility the comet nucleus may actually fragment and dissipate, and we'll get a worst case scenario where the comet will fizzle out completely. A bit like Comet Aizon a few years ago, I'm sure you all remember that, that was the biggest disappointment since uh, Deck in the 70s. Um, but we're hoping this one will hold its ground, hopefully the nucleus is strong and large and active and producing large amounts of gas or dust or both. So fingers crossed, I'm staying optimistic on this one and these tricky times at the minute, it's, I think it's, it's just the only way to handle things is to be optimistic and hope for a good show. So fingers crossed, we get a nice naked eye comet with a pronounced tail visible low in the northwest by early to mid May before it gets lost in solar glare. So I'm excited. And whatever it does we'll we'll deal with it. Even if it does fizzle out and maybe it'll do so in dramatic fashion. If it disintegrates and vanishes it'll be disappointing but that's okay. We'll pick ourselves up, move on, get ready for the next comet. So but with a bit of luck I have a good feeling about this one. We might see something nice in the near future. So fingers crossed. Um, at the moment I'm actually assessing the area because of the lockdown scenario I can't travel really far in a car and anything generally supposed to to, uh, to to find a dark location, good horizon, all the kind of things I like. So at the, at the moment we're allowed one exercise a day, we're allowed to walk 
out and for her health and well-being which I'm glad we do have that option so I may actually use that opportunity at night time closer to the time and head out with my camera gear or binoculars into a field in the local area and uh, hunt this comet down and get a few photographs and if it comes bright enough I may even put the drone up and get some shots of it in the twilight so that'd be pretty cool we'll see how the Mavic handles that one but anyway back to uh, observing on this lovely sunny day okay success mid-afternoon and I managed to observe planet Venus with the naked eye in broad daylight what I did was I, uh, I used a tree or a pole, the telescope, the side of the house, whatever you have close to hand. I blocked the sun with that object and then I let my eyes adjust to the blue sky and made sure to train my eyes to focus on infinity. That means focusing your eyes past any drifting cirrus clouds or anything like that or birds further away. You train your eyes and then it'll pop out. It took a while but you need good transparency. Today the sky is good and transparent. Uh, it took me a while to do it, but I eventually got there. I tracked down the crescent moon first with the naked eye to the east of the sun, and then knowing where the moon was, that showed me where the, the ecliptic plane was. So the ecliptic was actually extending away from the sun to the upper left at an angle. Uh, Venus is currently located slightly above the moon on the ecliptic plane at approximately 40, 46 degrees solar elongation. So I measured 46 degrees to the east of the sun and I scanned that area of sky keeping my eye relaxed and during a moment of good seeing it popped into view perfectly. So I got to see it for the first time in a long time I've done this so it looks like a, a, a white pearl or a little white ball against a blue sky. You can actually see the moon and Venus together in the same naked eye field of view. Venus is I measured it at approximately 15 degrees to the northeast of the crescent moon so quite a nice thing to do, I have to say. Really enjoyed doing that. And uh, it should look nice after sunset tonight. It may cloud over the night according to the forecast. I'm not sure. If it doesn't, I'll, get, I'll do some observing. If not, then I'll be turning on our night. But that was a nice exercise. Try it yourself sometime if you're interested in a naked eye challenge or daylight astronomy. Just make sure to protect your eyes. Never stare at the sun with a naked eye. Oh, Rhea. Or through a telescope or a pair of binoculars because it'll destroy your, your destroy your eyes, it'll actually turn, make you blind. So never do that. So make sure to block the sun. Sometimes I use my hand, block the sun with your hand, use the side of a house or tree and let your eyes adjust and work from there. Once you see it, it's easy to see again. And another thing, it's a good opportunity for learning to measure uh, angles in the sky. Uh, I use my hand. You're, if you put your hand at arm's length, you can measure distances in the sky. This applies to daytime and night, of course. On, why is this working? Uh, a fist at arm's length is five degrees. A thumb is approximately two degrees. Three fingers is five degrees. Uh, a thumb and a second finger is, sorry, inside and outside fingers, 15 degrees. And a thumb and little finger extended as wide as, as about 20 degrees or more. So you can use that to measure your way across the sky. So, so I'm currently observing planet Venus here in daytime, this time through the 8-inch telescope. I first tracked it down with the naked eye, which was a fun challenge, and now I've turned the, the instrument on it. And it's it's pretty fun to observe in daytime. Believe it or not, there are several planets you can actually observe in daytime through telescopes. And even some people have observed stars in the middle of the day as well. Would you believe that? Yeah. At the minute the seeing conditions are quite turbulent due to the, the solar heating and the unstable skies. So the planet is uh, flickering somewhat, it waxes and wanes out, in and out of focus. A bit like observing a planet from underneath a swimming pool. But that's a, that's a product of the uh, quality of our atmosphere and the heating. But even so, I can see the planet clearly, even in this low power 26mm eyepiece. You can clearly see that Venus looks like a, a, a thick crescent, almost a, like a first quarter moon. And it appears to have some kind of shading on the, the terminator between light and dark, even at low power. But it's just such a, a fun thing to do. It's peculiar to look at a planet uh, against a blue sky through a telescope where the sun's still shining on your face. I used to enjoy doing this years ago all the time. 
back in the day we did a lot of observing, daytime and nighttime observing, every clear day and night. My mate Connor and I would we'd have the we'd have this telescope out the eight inch and we also had the Mead ninety mil ETX and that telescope I had fitted with a solar filter. It was actually a Bedar sheet of Bedar Astro solar filter. It comes in a big sheet, you buy it online and you can you make your own um, solar filters out of it. So I made a solar filter for the ETX to fit over the front of the aperture, uh, one for the front of the finder scope, and I made a big one for this one here at one stage. So that way you were able to observe the sun sun itself directly in daytime and see the sunspots, which is awesome. Uh, there's an easier way to do it using the projection method, projecting the sun onto a sheet of card or a sheet of paper and a cardboard box, which I used recently to observe the transit of or to, yeah, the transit of Mercury. But uh, even just getting out in the daytime to look at a planet is incredible. And for people who are just beginning to get into astronomy, they don't actually realise you can see planets in the daytime. So I welcome them to try it. Keep safety in mind, but all, all things good, it'll train your eyes to look for detail, it'll train your eyes to focus on infinity, and it'll make you more, uh, it'll, it'll uh, test your averted vision and improve them kind of techniques, which will later on will come in handy for the night sky when observing faint objects. But this has been a pure, pure pleasure today, it really has. It's, we've got buzzards buzzing around here, and for some reason we've got a, flock, a big dense flock of seagulls come over. I don't know why, it's rare to see them here in Cookstown. Usually you get that in a real stormy day, but they're here. And there's birds running around the place, the place is full of life. The blue sky, sunshine, I feel really good with the vitamin D. It feels like one of those classic spring days. Uh, it's hard to believe what's going on in the world or, and around us at the minute. You wouldn't think it. An invisible killer out there, but yet everything looks so beautiful and, and perfect. But I'm going to enjoy Venus here, make the most of that, the afternoon, and... I'm going to enjoy Venus here and make the most of the afternoon. And I'm periodically reading Leslie Pelty's Starlight Night as well, which I talked about in my last last vlog. Great book. Highly recommend it again if you're into astronomy, if you want to read something to do with the passion of stargazing, the why of stargazing, not the how, but the why. Check out Leslie Pelty's Starlight Night. A good companion to have on a sunny day. I don't know why I'm cracking my neck here for, but uh, these diagonals have come with the, these larger telescopes. You can rotate them around any direction you want. I should be sitting in the seat for added comfort. The more comfortable you are, the more detail you're going to see. But I've kind of got in the habit over the years of going into a stance and just supporting my weight and observing because I tend to move around a lot with the telescope from one object to another, so I'm rarely in the one position. But I think I'm going to rotate it this way and set up set up a chair and enjoy it. You you might have noticed that I have no finder scope on the telescope. That's just the rings and just to hold an old finder. But keep in mind if you are observing the sun during the daylight with, with solar filters or hunting down the planet, make sure you either remove your finder scope or cover it just in case a family member comes along and has a look for the telescope and maybe over the passage of time the earth's rotated and the sun has moved into view and maybe the sun is looking is coming down suddenly it's coming through the telescope but somebody might accidentally look in the eyepiece and blind themselves so something to keep in mind yes yeah, nice now the sky is less turbulent i can see the planet very well defined like a first quarter moon with shading along the day night terminator the, yeah just like the moon it's like a miniature moon in the daytime sky so i'm gonna head on here and just relax and get the barbecue ready